And welcome back to a new video on the Essex Boys case. As always, if you are enjoying the content, please do give the video a thumbs up. And if you're interested in the Essex Boys case, or simply true crime in general, don't forget to hit the subscribe button below. The lover of one of three men shot dead in their Range Rover wept yesterday as police warned of a power struggle among drug barons. Donna Jaggers, 26, said, I would just like anyone who was with them on Wednesday afternoon or who knows anything about what happened or has seen anything to just come forward. We need all the help we can get. Donna lived with Craig Rolfe, 26, owner of the Range Rover, for seven years. They have one child, age seven. Rolfe should have been taking Donna to dinner the night he was killed. He was seen at 6pm on Wednesday and had arranged to meet her at a restaurant at 8pm. Police now believe the three friends, all with underworld drug links, died between 6pm and 9pm rather than later that night. Rolf was found in the driving seat of the F Reg vehicle in Rettendon, Essex. Bodyguard Tony Tucker, 38, was in the front passenger seat and Patrick Tate, 37, was slumped in the back. Detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley, who is leading the hunt, said all three had been shot in the head twice at point-blank range. Tate had been shot a third time in the body. The weapon, which has not been found, is thought to be a 12-bore shotgun. The men had criminal records, including armed robbery, drugs offences and car theft, but were not convicted drug dealers. Detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley states, Our intelligence is that they were moving into the drugs field, and that is the line that we are currently trying to develop, said Mr Dibley. They were higher in the scale than street dealers. It may be that this has occurred over higher drugs dealers trying to find a greater position of power. Perhaps there's been a falling out in that connection. My view is that there could be a power struggle going on. There could have been a double cross and someone has sought retribution. Or it might be that someone is owed money and they did not pay their bill. I think these are valid theories because drugs offer quick money and easy money. There is this power struggle amongst the larger dealers. Inevitably, there are going to be instances such as this occurring. I don't think Essex is any worse than anywhere else, however. I anticipate that someone will try to fill the void that these deaths have created and that there could be more violence. Mr Dibley added, There has been a lot of speculation overnight that this killing was connected with the tragedy of Leah Betts. I must say that this is pure speculation by the media. There is nothing factual to link these men with the tragedy of Leah Betts. I'm afraid that if this is allowed to continue, it may well divert attention from my inquiry on this murder and will take me away from the real investigation. I would appreciate if the connection between Leah Betts and this triple murder is dropped. At this moment in time, there is nothing to suggest that they distributed drugs to Leah Betts or any of her associates. Now, really only one talking point to come out of this particular article, and that is what is mentioned near the end there. Now, most of you will be well aware that it was Tony Tucker who supplied the ecstasy tablet, which at the time was thought to have killed Leah Betts. This was very clear, very evident to those in surrounding circles and those in the area. But apparently, according to Detective Inspector Ivan Dibley, there's a desire here, a real need to distance this whole situation from the triple murders. It's also worth remembering, as I've discussed in other videos, that Leah Betts' parents were two of the first individuals interviewed after they discovered the bodies of Tucker, Tate and Rolf. To put it plainly, what is said here by Detective Inspector Ivan Dibri, quote, There has been a lot of speculation overnight that this killing was connected with the tragedy of Leah Betts. I must say that this is pure speculation by the media. There is nothing factual to link these men with the tragedy of Leah Betts. Then can you explain why these three individuals were under surveillance leading up to their murder by the drug squad? 
This in investigator, this inspector, knew damn well that Tony Tucker was responsible for the supplying of that ecstasy tablet. What is written here is just a pure lie. There's no other way of putting it. It's a complete and utter lie. Now, in my opinion, so early on after discovering the bodies of Tucker, Tate and Rolf, it would be imperative, absolutely imperative, that all avenues of investigation are kept open. But here we have the lead investigator closing down a large part of the potential motive for these murders, shutting it away, closing it down, telling the media, if you carry on going on about this, if you carry on printing stories that these three men are linked to Leah Betts, it's going to take me away from the real murder investigation. Well, I'm sorry, but surely at this point in time, just 24 hours after discovering the bodies, all lines of inquiry should remain open. The next newspaper article comes from the 8th of December 1995 with the headline, Trio Lured to Their Deaths. The three men found murdered in a Range Rover parked in a remote lane off the A130 were known villains from South Essex and could have been victims of a gangland killing. The police refused to comment this morning on speculation that the murders in a quiet village of Rettenden are linked to drug dealing connected with the death of teenager Leah Betts. One of the dead men was Patrick Tate, 37, of Gordon Road, Basildon, who had convictions for having cocaine with intent to supply and robbery. The others were Craig Rolfe, 26, of Calshot Avenue, Chafford 100, and Anthony Tucker, 38, of High Road Fobbing. Tucker was a former bodyguard to boxer Nigel Benn. Murder inquiry detectives are keeping an open mind on the possibility that the men who were discovered at Workhouse Lane yesterday morning were shot point blank by someone from the criminal underworld. Detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley said, It is a possibility, but there are a number of possibilities. This was no ordinary murder. These men were enticed to their deaths. But a police spokesman, when asked about allegations that the killings were connected to an ecstasy drugs ring, said, we are fully aware of the suggestions being made, but we have nothing new to say at the moment. The killings come just two months after a man dressed in a clown suit shot a patient at St Andrew Hospital, Billericay, in another gangland action. The bodies were found by a farmer and his friend as they drove up the snow-covered track near Wickford. The two men in the front were upright with gunshot wounds to the head. The third man was slumped across the back seat. There are no tracks from any other vehicles or footprints leading away from the scene, which is metres from the busy A130. One of the dead men was the known owner of the metallic blue vehicle, though he was not the registered owner. It was bought from Eastern Garages at Five Bells Vange around a month ago and had a registration F424NPE. Police have not recovered the weapon used to shoot the men who were in casual clothes and were not wearing seatbelts. Mr Dibley, who is running the investigation with 30 officers, said at a press conference last night, We still don't know the motive, but this may become clearer when we have positively identified these men. The window behind the front passenger seat was broken and shotgun cartridges were found near the scene. The dead men had not been tied or restrained with ropes and there was no sign of a struggle. Mr Dibley added, Whoever killed these three people is clearly a very dangerous man and until I catch him, I am concerned that he is still at large. OK, just a small thing to add onto this particular article is that it's stated here that Detective Ivan Dibley is very concerned. This is a, clearly a very dangerous man that is out on the loose. Yet in the book Blogs 19, which is written by Tony Thompson and co-written by Darren Nichols, he states in that book that they had an idea, or basically that he knew that it was Michael Steele behind these murders around 36 hours after finding the bodies. Yet it takes some months before they even approach Michael Steele and arrest him. Now, would you allow someone who you were basically convinced had committed triple murder to walk free on our streets? There's nothing to say that early sort of police surveillance was put on Michael Steele. There was obviously surveillance put on him nearer the time of his arrest. But... He sort of mentions here that he's very anxious, very concerned that this dangerous person is on the loose. Yet, if this was Michael Steele who committed the crime, if he was convinced just 36 hours after these murders were committed that Michael Steele was the perpetrator, 
then why did he let this man go for so many months until bringing him in in May 1996? If you would like to learn more about the Range Rover murders, then click on the video in front of you now. You will also see the Essex Boys playlist, which has all of the videos concerning this case in one convenient folder. Many thanks for joining me for this video. I look forward to seeing you all again for the next one. Take care. Cheers.